And so my name is Raquel Wilson. I am the proud program manager for the Youth Voices Rises program. Um, here we offer so many different opportunities, but we are a media and journalism writing training program first. Um, we like to teach our lived experience participants how to turn their lived experience into publishable pieces um, that ultimately can be used to reshape some policy, reshape the system, encourage foster youth, encourage those who, um, who serve us. And we offer tons of internship opportunities, journalism, contributor roles, um, and just different, um, different, um, you know, opportunities dedicated to those who have experienced the child welfare system, the juvenile justice system, and homelessness. And so we want to thank you all um, from Foster Media Connections Youth Voices Rising program for being here today. Um, there will be a copy of this recording that you will receive in your follow-up email. Um, and so, yes, we're excited to have you all here today. Please um, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where organization you're representing, what city or state you're from. Um, and we would love to know all, all of the above about you. And so if you would like to stay informed about what we are doing here at the Youth Voices Rise Us program and all of the opportunities and resources that we have to offer those with lived experiences, please feel free to follow us on our um, with our VR newsletter. This is the most in, um, intriguing way, I would say, to stay um, informed about all of the things that we're doing in addition to our social medias, which our Instagram also is another um, vital tool that we use to um, and share share most of our um, a majority of our opportunities on there. So please feel free. Um, there's going to be a link that we drop in the chat for you if we haven't dropped it already um, that you could go and sign up so that you can stay informed about all of the wonderful things we're doing here. And then so at this time, you should see um, a couple of questions pop up on your um, screen. And this is just for us to identify um, you know, who you are, if you're from a foster youth, if you're a resource parent, we would love to know. And especially how did you hear about this event um, in particular um, so that I can make sure that I'm doing a better job and a, a good job of um, getting all of this information out to the public and that we are, um, you know, sharing our events across the nation. And so these are really some important conversations with those who have had lived experiences, um, there's really some good, um, there's going to be some really, really good answers and some good feedback and suggestions that you guys can all take away. So we want to know, you know, how did you hear about this? Where did you hear about this from? And, you know, what, um, if you are a foster youth, um, someone that is um, of lived experience or representing um, resource parents or social workers, judges, et cetera. And then so we should see the survey results pop up on the screen, but we're just going to allow some time for some other folks um, to um, join in on the, the survey. But we also want to just thank everyone who participated in this um, survey. It really helps me, um, you know, identify what I could be doing better as the program manager, um, making sure that these conversations are getting into the right hands um, and across the right um, platforms. So again, thank you everyone that have participated in the survey. We're extremely excited to have you join us today um, and sharing all of the wonderful conversations about um, college and the hurdles that foster youth um, face while trying to get to college, trying to finish college, et cetera. Um, we wanna talk about you know, the importance of you know, having mentors and you know, um, applying um, for resources and scholarships so that you can have the necessities to actually finish school and how, um, you know, those around foster youth and those who live experiences can also be supportive and, you know, identifying risks, challenges, obstacles that foster youth can face potentially before they even get to school so that we can identify some things and help them along the way so that we can in, um, decrease the dropout rate and increase the graduation rate. And so without further ado, I would love to introduce all of our lovely panelists and welcome all and every one of you guys here again today. And so um, first up, 
we have Jasmine Mora. And so Jasmine Mora is a full-time event production professional in Los Angeles and a part-time English, English language arts instructor. She has lived experience as a former foster youth in the group home system and later as a kinship caregiver. She hopes by sharing her story, people may become interested in becoming a mentor um, or a caregiver to um, the many teenagers in foster care. And so Jasmine, thank you so much for joining us here today. Jasmine recently just published an article with us um, regarding Mother's Day, and she has an upcoming article coming out about some of the struggles um, and the importance of, um, you know, school event drives um, and school and, and, and foster youth receiving donations and school supplies. And so again, Jasmine, thank you so much for being here with us today. We're always happy to have you. Um, next soon, but certainly not least, we have Alex Guerrero, and I hope I said your last name correctly. Please let me know if I messed that up. Um, but Alex Guerrero is a recent graduate from Cal State University, Long Beach, where she earned her bachelor's degree in international studies and social science. She chose these focus areas because Alex wanted to connect all of her passion for human rights, social good, and politics into one. She is a first generation student and the first in her family to graduate from college. Alex has had to overcome being a foster child to separate times in her life. Now working in a nonprofit, she hopes to be a voice for the voiceless. And so, Alex, thank you also so much for joining us here today. Um, you guys can also find an article through our Selfless Love pro um, Project from last year that Alex participated in um, um, on our um, on our website. And then she also has an article coming out um, soon that's going to be published on college experiences um, and obstacles and hurdles that foster you um, face while being in school. And so, Alex, thank you so much for being here with us today. And so um, next we have Niasia Kinsey. And so Niasia is a former foster youth, has been through many traumas, some in which they, um, that they've overcome and others will remain. Now, Kinsey uses these lessons to give to others a clearer path on the road to adulthood by serving as a foster youth officer. Additionally, Kinsey is a college student earning a bachelor's degree as a health science major and attends to spread their message on foster care injustice as far and wide as possible. Through public speaking, Kinsey knows that they will and have touched the lives and hearts of others in an effort to combat the negative outcomes of the foster care system. And so Niasia, thank you so much for participating here today. Niasia is here represented in New York foster youth and the New York foster care experience. You can read the um, many articles that Niasia has published through our UYVR program um, on our under our imprint column. And um, she's just a force to be reckoned with. And so Niasia, thank you. She's also one of our New York contributors that is is uh, getting ready to graduate from our um, 2023 cohort. So Niaja, we want to thank you so much for being here today. It's always a pleasure to have you. And so last but certainly not least, we have Loie Catro. And I hope that I said that um, I, I feel like I butchered that. So, Loey, please tell me if I messed that up. I, just judging by your laugh right now, and I know that I did. So, I'm so, so, so sorry. But Lo is a 2020, a 22 year old working professional and former foster youth. They have worked to support themselves since they were 18 and have been in the foster system for five years. Loey is very passionate about film and TV and anything to do with humanities and the arts. They are focused on furthering futures for foster youth and their passions to be professional in the film industry. And so, Loey, thank you so much for being here today. Um, we have recently connected. She has, um, they are also um, working on a piece that will be published um, in our column on college hurdles and, um, and, and obstacles that college you face. And so, Loey, we're definitely happy to have you here today. I am so sorry for butchering your name, um, butchering your last name, but I'm definitely going to figure out how to pronounce it. And so just thank you all so much for being here. And so um, I would like to um, first get started by having you guys um, explain to the audience or ex um, express to the audience, you know, your background. Um, briefly and how you got involved in the foster care system, basically your history. Um, and so, Loie, we're going to start with you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Can you hear me good? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, my name is Loie. And for the pronunciation, it's Italian Spanish. It's a weird name. It's Quattro or just Quattro. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay, though. I like I liked what you said better, but um, yeah, so uh, my background or history in foster care. Um, 
Okay, um, so basically I am a bit more, I guess, of a rare case. I was put in the foster care system um, pretty late, um, but still had like a lot of active. I was kind of, like before the system, I was getting passed from home to home basically, but still living with, which is a common reality of a lot of foster kids is that before you're in the system, sometimes you're still living with somebody's friend's family, some somebody's aunt, you're getting passed around a lot if you can't be taken care of. So I had a very mixed background and I was raised really, um, like multi homes and I grew up with a lot of people raising me. And then by the age of 16, I got put in the system. So I got put qu quite late in the system. And I also had to face when, uh, when I got put in, this was about 20, um, this was 2017. So all the new bills had just been passed and a lot of new rules were initiated. So basically all the rules of foster care and social work in the nineties had changed. And so we had to deal with a lot of hurdles. I had a lot of uh, challenges I faced when I was in the system at that time. There's a lot of like no answers, a lot of no one talking to me, not having my social worker's name or phone number, not having anything to use to contact anybody for weeks and weeks on end. And so, yeah, that's a bit of my history of how I got in there. And then um, bits of struggles trying to figure it out from now on. Um, I am considered a uh, basically like an extremely dependent um, foster youth ward. So I'm uh, seen as a ward of the state, ward of the court, and I don't have any uh, connections to my uh, biological relatives uh, or legal guardians at this point. So it's a very uh, isolating position and I'm just trying to find my way with more foster youth, more mentors, more programs. And this is kind of the path of like, have being a foster kid where maybe it doesn't work out with extra connections with legal guardianships, kind of like having to figure it out without as many personal resources. So yeah, so now I'm here and I'm currently trying to go back to school. So yeah. <laughs> yes, congratulations. Thank you so much, Loie, for your introduction and we appreciate you. And I love your last name too, by the way. Um, and so, yes, so I will pass it over to Niaja and then Alex and Jasmine, please feel free um, to chime in um, once Niaja finishes. Hello, everyone. My name is Niaja Kensey. Um, for me, foster care started about 15, when I was about 15, I'm sorry. Um, it, it wasn't really as um, traumatic as, you know, a lot of other cases. Uh, because we went into kin gap at first with my grandmother. Um, then later on, my grandmother, she's still alive and strong today, um, but she suffered a amputation, a heart attack and a stroke all at the same time. Doctors told her she wouldn't make it, but of course here she is today. Um, afterwards, um, she decided that she didn't want to die in New York City, so she went back home to North Carolina. For me, I, I moved from home to home, a lot of homes. I had about eight to 10 foster homes after um, she gave us up. Um, and, you know, I, I do respect, I wanna say I respect her decision because, you know, I feel like we all should live the life that we want to live as, as, a, as a child. You know, I didn't understand, I was angry, but now growing up, I completely understand why my grandmother chose to the decision made the decision that she did um for me i'm one of five foster i'm one of five siblings so i actually do know um my family um i went into foster care a little late on as well as 15 um but um we still stayed connected and i'm grateful for that um now i am a struggling college student but raquel is helping me <laughs> um and and um you know one day I will make it I'm the first to go to college but um just to give a little update my brother graduated with his bachelor so I'm not the first to finish and he always thanked me for like just letting him know like you know no matter what you go through in life you can just keep pushing and you you it, so many different people make it to the same space so thank you guys it was nice talking to you all that's my little introduction. You'll see a lot more of me. I can go next. So, hi everyone, my name is Alex Guerrero 
and I am a former foster youth and I entered the system at age six. I was, um, I entered the system due to alcoholism and substance abuse with my parents. Um, both of them lost custody and I spent three years in a foster care home. Um, I was the youngest of three, but it always felt like I was the oldest because I was always the most responsible, but um, I spent uh, those three years um, in one home. So I was really lucky and fortunate to be in that home. But later on, I was reunited with my dad and I moved to Long Beach, California, where I grew up for the majority of my life. Unfortunately, as for many foster youth, the rate of their parents falling back into certain issues was the case for me and my dad fell back into substance abuse and I re-entered the foster care system at the age of 15. Uh, this time into kinship care so I grew up, I was already growing up with my grandma um, but I ended up being formally placed into her care and being a ward of the state at age 15. I was able to continue going to the same school which allowed me to progress and feel that sense of community that a lot of foster youth unfortunately don't get to face feel um, but yeah unfortunately a lot of the ups and downs did ultimately become reflected in my education and I was barely able to get through high school but I'm really proud to say that I'm a college graduate today and I work for a nonprofit and I hope that in the future I can work for one uh, related to foster youth giving back in, in the Hi everyone, um, I'm Jasmine and I'm in Los Angeles. So I entered foster care when I was 13 years old. I'm the oldest of six siblings and my mother was 15 when I was born. So I think there were many moments throughout my childhood, um, sort of like growing up in an abusive and neglectful home where I could have entered foster care when I was younger, but my mother was involved with, um, you know, she was incarcerated. She was in, involved in, a, in selling drugs, like doing all kinds of things that I think were just not being um, monitored by people and then entered care at 13. Um, and my siblings and I all sort of ended up in different um, situations after her incarceration. But I actually was in the group home system in Los Angeles. So I lived in three different group homes um, and was in the group home system until I went to college. Um, I, I did graduate from college in 2014. Um, and then about a year and a half after I graduated from college, both my youngest sisters entered care. Um, so I became their kinship caregiver. And that was in, I think that was in 2015, 2016. So I became their kinship caregiver. That was for an 11 year old and a 12 year old. Um, I, they successfully graduated from high school and are now both in college. One's at Berkeley and one's at Humboldt State. So I just finished my first year of being like an empty nester without teenagers in my care, but I'm here to sort of share my experience of uh, as both being a foster youth and kinship caregiver, because I stepped up to be a kinship caregiver because of um, my foster care ex experience and wanted to make sure that they had a, a different experience than I did. So happy to be here. Yes, and we are so happy to have all of you guys. Just thank you so much. Like this, the wonderful introductions, the experience that you guys um, and, um, have had. Um, you know, the expertise that you get to take away from being both in the system and now on, on the other side of the spectrum, you know, i.e. working in, working with foster youth now, or even have being a care provider for kin, uh, as a kinship caregiver. Um, that's just really amazing. So applaud to you, uh, applaud, I think I'm saying this right, to you all um, for the amazing work that you guys have been doing, um, you know, just not forgetting about, not, you know, in the sense of like where you came from, but like really using the the things that you have learned or have accomplished or overcame over the years, um, you know, to put you in the position to now reach back um, into the community and help others. And so um, that's the importance of these conversations like these. And so we're really grateful. And so 
Um, I wanna, want you, would love for you guys to describe some of the challenges that have impacted um, you as a foster youth, um, you know, through school. And what are some of the like general, um, you know, challenges that you have saw, you know, maybe maybe through the your own, um, your own per personal experience or through the lenses of, you know, what you saw with others' experiences, um, some of the impacts that keep, um, you know, foster youth from being able to um, actually excel in school. And so Jasmine, I'll pass it to you first. Yeah, um, I mean, I think we're all aware of like so many different things, but I think from my experience, um, one, I, I'm i always very grateful that I had school because from a very young age, like I think I did well um, in school. And so when things started to get really difficult at home, I think I just felt like school could be a safe place for me. Now. Um, because I entered foster care at 13, and even though I moved around in different group homes, I was able to go, um, I was able to finish middle school, and then I was able to go to one high school. And I think that um, having, it really feels like a luxury that I was able to go to one high school, because I was living in a group home with 12 other teenagers. Um, it was a co-ed group home, and I saw a lot of the youth who were older than me, um, you know, this might have been like their 10th placement. Um, they had different school schools that they went to. Some people did um, like alternative school or online school. And so I think disruption, like we all know that the disruption that happens with school, um, there is no stability. Like there is no stability within the education system. Um, and on top of that, although I did go to one school, the school that I did go to and the group home that I lived in, I felt like between my social worker, case manager, like all these people were in my life, but no one was providing any guidance to me specifically on next steps. I felt like I was either finding things out as I was aging, as I was going from grade to grade, or I would find out from my peers at school, like what was happening. Um, so I think like the la the amount of information and consistent information ratio to like the number of adults that are in like our life, it does not match. Um, so I think that was a, a big struggle for me was just like not having concrete support. I think there were a lot of like well-meaning people in involved that like wanted to be encouraging and wanted to help. And I think they all thought that they were helping, but they were not actually giving me any like um, kind of step-by-step -step guide of like what I should be doing. I think somehow everyone thought someone else was doing that um, or that, the, that my high school was doing that. And so I think I just remember just feeling like this great deal of pressure of like having to figure it out and then constant, constantly asking questions. And on the flip side, then being a, a kinship caregiver to two teenagers, I felt like I took my experience so heavily that like I, you know, wanted to handhold everything. I wanted to explain everything so much that in like eighth grade, I was already talking to them about like their junior year and senior year because I felt like I didn't want them to feel like they, no one told them or that I didn't tell them what would sort of happen next. Um, because most of the times we don't have people in our life long enough to tell us about the future or we're just also not thinking about the future and they're not fully thinking about the future um for us so i hope that kind of answers a little bit of your question yes no you answered uh, like right on right on the money and then like you really hit like some really really good like you know like suggestion tools like that I hope that people are listening on this call can take away like it's important that youth are not you know shuffled around through different schools that was like one of the experiences that I had um it's important that you know they have support as they if they're going to be cycled or shuffled around and so I think that you really hit on some like key elements that you know impede foster you from being able to be successful in school and so thank you so much Jasmine and I love that you're offering your perspective um through the eyes of the kinship um you know caregiver too as well because it's almost that sense of like I want to protect them because they had no one protecting me I want to give them that knowledge because no one gave them that knowledge too but then also having to have like that like 
you know, exhale like moment where you know you have to let them go. Like, you know, you know you have to let them go, be free and learn on their own. And so, um, you know, when we as we get through the webinar, I'm going to come back to you because I also want to talk about some of that like trauma that, you know, that comes up with like working in these spaces after care and, you know, going back into the system to be kinship parents. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jasmine. I um, mean, so Alex, um, the same question, you know, what are some of the challenges that you have identified, you know, through your personal experience or the experiences of others that have, um, you know, that keep foster you from being able to excel in school? Yeah, so for me, I would agree that the lack of stability is the biggest thing that affects foster youth's ability to attain an education. Um, I mean, I was fortunate enough to be pretty much in the same school system, surrounded by similar peers, um, but there was a lot of trauma happening around me. And the reality is that none of us on this call entered the system because of positive experiences. We had to overcome really serious obstacles and face adverse childhood experiences. And um, a lot of these things compounded can come with toxic stress and those things impact a child's ability to learn and function in a classroom. So for many foster youth, we're living in a survival mode and that makes it difficult to adapt to the challenges that come with you know, changing to high school or going to college. Um, so growing up, I always loved school, but uh, there were just ups and downs that were reflected with what the circumstances were in my life. And despite school being like a safe haven for me, um, there were just challenges. And so I tried as much as possible to control my destiny with education. And I think a lot of us try to do the same um, because we see it as like a golden ticket out of uh, what we've been experiencing for our whole lives. So. Um, at different points in my life, I, I deteriorated and then did better, but I ended up um, with a, like a less than a 2.0 high school GPA. So, um, you know, I was a well-spoken child, but I just didn't have the support and the stability in my life to always do the best. And I think that's the same for a lot of our industry. Yes, thank you so much, Alex. I love that you mentioned survivor mode, um, you know, and stability being, lack of stability being an um, important key factor. Um, and that's something that we definitely are going to chime into later on of like what that's what that support could look like um, and offer some advice to some of our um, attendees in the audience today. So thank you so much. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um. Yeah, so you can hear me, right? Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I was kind of thinking in my head, okay, like how do we answer that question? Because I think everyone's experience is different. Everyone has a different experience going through the foster care system and how it like will affect their schooling. And, and, and if you can even get to school, because you know, a lot of times for my situation, I was in a lot of, I was in a group home and I was in a group home where a lot of people had a lot of siblings and that was just, we never even would talk about it. Like they would barely think that they were gonna finish high school. And I remember even sometimes like tutoring people in my group home because I was, I went to a really, really nice public school that was practically a private school before I got put in the, um, the welfare system, before I got put in foster care, I was going to, I had a really, really like on paper, nice cushy life because we had to do that to keep up appearances. And when I got put in the system, it was kind of like this, you know, I was playing this perfect role. I was a star student and then everyone kind of looked behind the curtain and they didn't believe what was behind the curtain. But now, uh, now all these years have passed. What I'm trying to say is I've boiled it down to two things that everyone probably already knows, but it's literally money <laughs> and lack of shared experiences that I think affect foster kids to want to either pursue education or continue education because in reality, money does not always mean check or dollars or any of that. Money is having a car. Money is having the time to go. Money is having not having to support yourself or your siblings or a sick relative who took care of you who you're taking care of now. It, it is literally the bottom of the barrel. It's not working class kids that are going to college. It's not, oh, we pick up a shift at McDonald's. It's people who have had nothing as their only thing, <laughs> that's the only thing you've ever had. And I will not get dramatic, but it's just, I went to, I, I was very fortunate. I was kind of on the weird end. So I got a full ride scholarship 
no loans, no anything. I got a full ride scholarship to a four year university. Weirdly the same university as Alex, shout out. Um, <laughs> Uh, looks like she's doing like she's doing great. Hated my time there, but um, I I got a full ride scholarship um, to a four year university, which is quite rare. I didn't pay a cent. I got free housing. I did all the little you know checked every box off. Foster kid graduating with high honors in high school. I won six awards. I did all the things I was supposed to. And I get there, and not only is the money a huge struggle because I was actually in a really like it just was very, the people I was with, the people I was staying in the dorms were quite different classes than me economically and no one related to me. I didn't even connect with a lot of foster youth there. The 30 that I met, uh, majority, it felt like I was kind of a ghost in someone else's shadow of all these kids who had their cars and their families and their lives. And all. it just every day felt like an episode of a drama that I wasn't even a star in. It felt like I was just a supporting character. And I, I struggled because I couldn't connect with people. I couldn't leave campus because I didn't have a car or a license. And I could never really get that feeling of agency that I think a lot of people can if you have the right resources and the right time and the right mindset with school. I think what I'm trying to say is it's not don't pursue college, but there has to be more resources and talk and conversation about the fact that it's not just the drive. These kids are not passionate. These kids are not lack of intelligence. These kids have not been affected um, in, in their smarts or even their like, you know, developing skills because of what happened to them. If anything, I'd say foster kids are a bit smarter because they're alive. They're still alive after everything they saw, you know, and you see a lot. And I think if anything, there's this stigma that because of the system, what we did, what we saw, whatever their parents did, whatever association they have, including myself, that affects your intelligence or that affects how much you know how good you are at certain subjects or, or if you'll even finish school at all if you'll even make it out of the streets or the system and the thing is at the end of the day those hurdles the money the lack of experiences the lack of resources that is what's stopping them not their intelligence these kids are a lot smarter than anyone will ever, ever understand because they haven't lived what these kids have survived and so that's that's where i get very passionate about it but it's just that's that's my personal thought and experience on it and i think more and more need to be talking about you know it's not the lack of drive or the lack of intelligence, it's the, the lack of actual support that these kids, you know, and all of us, you know, have continued to need. And, and you need past 21, past the, the legal hurdles that they put on us, especially the ones that don't have any other resources. So, you know, hopefully things can be changing soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I love, I love that you bought um, and gave grace to, you know, those who live experience because a lot of people don't give us that. A lot of people don't think about the factors that, you know, and the trauma and experiences. They just kind of look at us like, well, you guys are angry or you guys are bad, like, you know, and like, you know, that's not the case. Um, and so I really appreciate you for, you know, bringing it back to, you know, foster youth, because these are all some of the stereotypes um, that we've all kind of experienced, some of the identities that folks have tried to place on us, um, you know, and some of these can be, um, you know, some of the reasons why um, some of us don't even want or have the desire um, to go to school. I don't even know how many people told me that I wasn't even, you know, like, don't go to college, you know, that's something that you shouldn't do. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm literally having fights and they can't kick me out of school because I got 3.0 GPA average, like, you know, it's like really crazy. And so, you know, the support needs to be there, you know, and it goes back to, um, to Alex's point, you know, having that sustainability and why sustainability is so important. And so thank you so much, Loewe, for, um, for chiming in and answering that question. And so, um, Asia, would you like to chime in on this one too as well? Hello guys, hello. Um, for me, um, Raquel knows very well um, how hungry I can be. So that that's where it came from. So, you know, the first person to go to college, you know, I'm looking at the fact that, you know, every time I turn around, I don't even have tissue, my own tissue. You know, I don't even have my own toothpaste. Now I'm wondering, am I gonna even be worthy enough to qualify for a home? It, break, it broke me down mentally, personally. Uh, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know who I was going to get the help from because I, I knew my family very well. And, and although it's all love, we go from 
needing a place to stay to not understanding what it takes to have a home and what it takes to maintain a home to understanding that you know your family you know are they there although they should help you you know they're wondering okay if i give you two months what are you, what can you do with that and in new york city it's <laughs> two months and then you're right back homeless so it's a, just a little vacation a little getaway and nobody wants that you have to you know be prepared to start your family and everything so for me i would say what would help foster children best is the resources that we deserve and the resources that you know like i feel like there should be some sort of compensation you know like the age the age limit should be risen to at least at least um to be honest 30 because by the time you we're even supposed we're even supposed to finish school we're supposed to be like 25 then after that should come housing assistance then after that should come you know like you know the makings of you know you as an adult you know because once you get out of school you're still in your 20s and you know that's 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 party time you know that's that's babysitting time you know i feel like we didn't really have structure so for me i got hungry i got upset and when i get upset I, I I take a challenge and I finish it. So that's just what happened. That was just turned out to become my addiction because you know my mom she struggled with um, substance abuse um, problems. Um, so for me, my anger and one of my substances became just success. And I say substance in equaling in terms of success because you know because I didn't have that support, because I had to be hungry and I had to always keep that drive on me, I, I never got to relax. So for me, you know, it's, it's a really big thing when it comes to having a laptop because we go through all this trauma and we like, we, we tend to like our isolation way too much. But, you know, sometimes it's really necessary just to get your mind right, to have that place to come to and to just relax. You know, we can't we can't just go to the school library all the time because by the time we transport from point A to point B, we, we need to start work. And it's just too much. So financial resources are is always my number one, because I do feel like, you, you know, we should be let go and we need that structure. We shouldn't be babied and we need that space to grow but we can't grow without finances. And it seems like we're greedy and we're mad and we're angry and we're upset, but that's because we don't have the resources to actually take a break. We don't have that person there to say, hey, you know what, take a break for today. I'll get you a laptop. Don't worry about it, you know? So it's just financial support is always something that I'm big on and self-worth and self-love. Like, you know, they have workshops on finances and stuff, but self-worth and self-love should be a workshop at least once a week. And it should be, you know, very much realistic and practical because, you know, we're gonna go through things. We're gonna be missing our family members. We're gonna lash out. And, and, and you know, we need to know, be taught that these things are normal. They need to normalize feelings when it comes to the agency and utilize their time wisely when it comes to us because the things that they teach us are the only things that we hear and it's the only things that we see so that's just my take on that i'm gonna pass it on yes come through with the poet snaps yes yes naija i i this is why i extremely love 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 and i know like we're doing our back to school drive so i wanted to have la county um you know former foster Reef on this call but then you know something just in the back of my mind i'm like let me just ask naija too as well because we need to have the other side of what's happening on the other side because the thing is is that while we're over here going through and battles and battling policies and um, talking about having conversations centered around you know obstacles and hurdles that foster you are trying to overcome it's happening on the other side it's happening in down south it's happening up north um you know these are experiences that were happening in 1990 you know that are still influencing and impacting the system and so you know having these type of conversations really 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 sets the tone to start holding organizations entities businesses corporations whatever people social workers foster parents all of us even ourselves accountable um you know for how the trajectory of our life 
um, you know, and the balance that it can have when we incorporate education, when we incorporate therapy, when we incorporate mental health, when we incorporate support and resources, um, you know, it can definitely be something that can be, you know, just, you know, that can take us through the roof. And so um, this question is for the folks who have um, who have lived experience um, with, you know, being in the group homes or the juvenile um, justice um, incarceration center, have experienced juvenile hall, et cetera. Um, you know, what are some methods that you think um, needs to change so that we can decrease um, the foster care um, to prison pipeline? And so, um, Jasmine, I'll pass it to you first. And then um, whichever one of you guys, and I believe Night Asia, I'm not sure if um, Loi or Alex has that experience, but if you guys do, please, please, please unmute um, yourself and join um, right after Jasmine. I think I can connect it back to the previous question too. So I did live in three group homes. Um, I was not in um, the juvenile justice system, but I do see that oftentimes like people will connect those two together. Um, and they could, they oftentimes are, and sometimes they, they are not. Um, I, I knew other youth in my, in my group home. So I probably lived with like over 300 youth in like my five years living in the different group homes. And like one of them was a homeless shelter. So I've seen like just so many different experiences of, uh, people who were older than me yet I mean and back then like I'm I'm older than all of you so I'm 30 so back then like I felt like I remember seeing on people's 18th birthday with a bag like okay you're like there was no anything support after 18 there was no there was very little like I you know IOP support things like that um but going back to the previous question and connecting it to this question is like, if anyone who is on this call listening, who doesn't have experience with the foster care system, and if you've ever traveled somewhere and kind of felt like, oh, like out of place and felt foreign and just known that this was something very different, like a lot of our experiences being in school and having abusive homes, like we're literally traveling between different worlds and feeling like foreigners in all these different places. And so that is very traumatizing. And what I mean by that is that even though we all worked really hard to get to college, when you get to college, you realize you don't know the language, you realize you don't know, like you just completely feel foreign. And so from the outside, it may seem like, oh, wow, like this young person, is doing well, they're in college, you know, they got the support. Um, you're now seeing a lot of your peers have a completely different experience than, than you. And that can be very, very isolating and affects your mental health. And if your mental health is deteriorating in a, in a space that you're supposed to be doing well in, um, and a lot of the support that, you know, we're quote unquote, guaranteed as former foster youth, none of that is without so much red tape, without lots of applications, following up phone calls, emails, like almost what feels like begging um, for this help. And I think when that can turn it, that can turn someone very like hostile. Like you just feel like you're going through your life begging for any kind of respect from your biological family, from your social workers, from your teachers, um, and oftentimes like that can turn into physically doing things, you know, substance abuse, crimes, like I, I think people like, it's just, I feel like sometimes folks like, will think like, you know, what resources do youth and it's like, we know what resources they need. Like, we know, we know what resources they need. It's like, how is the system going to actually provide those resources? Like, that's the question they need to ask is how do we make providing these, these tools and resources easier? How do we make it so that they can not have to call 10 different people for this support? I think that um, if you're not getting any support, if you're not getting any funding, if if everything is taking long, then yeah, you are going to steal something. Like in the group homes that I lived in, you know, everything was locked up. Like our fridges had locks, the pantries had locks. Um, the kids, like you know, we often took things. Like you had to just again 
constantly advocate slash like beg for some of these um, supports that you just felt like should be provided to you. Um, and so I did, I was always too scared. I was one of the younger kids. I was 13 compared to like the 16, 17 year old. So I, I just had a different temperament, but I did see a lot of, you know, stealing, bringing in drugs, doing drugs. And looking back, that is completely like understandable. Like it was a very difficult very difficult experience being in the group home system. Um, and again, that is why I decided to become a kinship caregiver because I saw what those experiences were like for lots of kids. And I knew, I knew that I was one, I was very lucky. I was very, very fortunate. And I do not let people like exceptionalize my experience um, because I have seen um, the norm and my experience is not the norm. And um, yeah, it's, it's, again, it is very much like the system will make things so, so difficult for you when it was already so difficult for you prior to joining the system. And so it ends up becoming kind of like this lifelong trauma response and turmoil. And then I just don't know how anyone can ask, well, like, why are they doing this? Why are they, it's like, well, what did you expect? No one ever gave anyone a chance um and that's why like mentorship and support and making things easier and people stepping up is so important because even with my own lived experience having my sisters did not make me an expert their experience was completely different than mine and um I still knew this much about how to help them even though I went through that experience myself because every child is different and every child needs a different sense of support Yes, Jasmine, you better come through with the come through. And I love, I love the analogy that you use. You got a lot of like uh, thumbs ups in the chat um, for the connection that you drew um, to both of those. So just thank you so much for that response. It was definitely lovely, like definitely lovely and so needed. Um, and so um, Loi, um, Niasia, Alex, did you guys want to chime in on this question? Please feel free to unmute yourself. I'm back, I'm <laughs> back again. Um, you know, like many foster kids, we all go through similar things. I definitely had the whole kitchen locked and it's, it's like, you know, it's early in the morning, I'm hungry, I need to eat, you know, to get, get out and start my day. And I wake up to a lock on the, the entire kitchen. So, you know, yeah, I just wanted to piggyback from, from um, her and, and just put that input in because it's it's really ridiculous, especially when they they get funding for us. Um, but my experience with the juvenile justice system came from a lot of sadness, hurt, and anger. Um, it's just we're not we're not treated like actual their actual children um, in the homes a lot of times. So. What happened with me was, you know, I realized that we weren't monitored. So, you know, um, again and again and again, I've been to eight to 10 foster homes. You know, I kept getting my clothes stolen. And this time I had just got mad. And the next time I had just got mad and it all wound me up in the bookings, which is a it's 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 pre jail. So I would I um, will wind up in the bookings, getting my my mugshot taken over and over and over again because somebody wanted to steal my clothes. You know, it was either that or let them keep taking my clothes or stay out of jail and make sure that I can go to school and I can make it to college. And I'm just gonna let this girl have my underwear <laughs> for the day. So it was just a lot um, in terms of like, and you know, the foster parents, they would, that I had, me personally, because all foster parents aren't bad, um, the foster parents that I had, they would just turn their backs to all, the both of us, to all of us. And whatever happened, happened. They were just ready to call either the hospital or the, the police. So, you know, that's what started me out on my journey to learning about the ins and outs of all of those systems when it came to the psychiatric ward, when it came to the bookings, when it came to 
school, when it came to assistance, you know, I realized very quickly that, you know, nobody really cared. But, you know, I did have some superheroes in my life. Um, my social worker, she was one of them. You know, she would encourage me all the time and say, you know, when are you going to college? And, you know, that's something I haven't heard from a lot for for a long time from my own mom. So, you know, she was out doing her substances. And whenever I would go up to the agency for resources, I would hear that from her. And I do believe that that's the only reason why I made it to college in the first place. And now I'm two classes away from my associates. And then I go into my bachelor soon. So, so yeah, definitely, you know, I really also wanted to chime in with that and say, you know, like I had one experience that was really good in, in foster care where I got to meet my foster parent and decide whether or not I wanted to go with her. That was surprising to me. So, you know, now knowing that they do that, I feel like if they have other foster youth inside of the home as well, they should come with the foster parent just so we can get a, a feel of each other, establish boundaries and, and, and then work from there because the problem is not just only with the foster parents or the social workers, it's with the teens or um, for me personally speaking, teens in the home. So that's what I would just recommend. Oh yeah, no, go ahead, Loie, you're good. I seen you, I, I seen you getting ready to touch down, mute your mute button. And thank you, Naisha, so much for your response. We appreciate that. Um, definitely, definitely, definitely has some key stuff on there. Um, but um, Loie, did you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, I saw you, I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you cracked me up, you're funny. Um, <laughs> no, I just, I didn't know if you were still in the same question. Um, yeah, so I, I didn't, okay, why am I nervous? Um, okay, so, the question, right, is kind of like, how do we break kind of that pipeline, prison to pipeline and all that, or, or really just any of the situations where it's like, okay, we're on a good track and then something happens, right? And so for me, I never officially, I guess, it's, it's very weird how this works. I, I found a lot of foster kids had this experience, like, okay, I never went to juvie, but I mean, <laughs> I never not did any things that maybe I wasn't supposed to be doing. <laughs> so there's there's always a bit of that situation where it's kind of like um what was previously said where it's like you do what you have to do when you've never had what you need <laughs> you know when you don't have what you need you do what you have to and sometimes that's not always going to be following by by the book because uh you don't get to follow by the book if you're never given a book <laughs> you're never given the opportunities then you know things are a little different um I was in group homes I think I was I was in about two and then I was basically I went to court previous for for you know they basically were warning us that we were going to go to juvie so it was like a warning trial um so not proud of it but <laughs> um basically my whole thing and I'll, I'll wrap it up and make it quick um my <laughs> my my whole thing right because I so I've had this on my mind for years like my entire time being in the system this whole it's not just pipe to prison line it's connected with everything people just mentioned, you know, foster kids, when people, I think if you're not in it, if you're not part of organization, you're not a social worker, you're not a welfare, you have no idea what it is, right? We have to be very blunt. People think of foster youth and they usually think of streets, drugs, jail. They think of something that is usually not like the actual people. I would say kind of what um, was said before of like, immediately being in a foster home and having unmonitoring and then you know your clothes getting stolen I had very similar experiences locks all the same thing what I try to tell people is like you live a life and you think I'm living GTA video game style if they even think of me as someone who can do that stuff because there's a lot of racial stigma there's a lot of stereotypes but then on top of that when you're actually in the group home right you're actually living it I always told people it was like the most unfun real life action version of game of uh of uh, hunger games i was like it was like it was like if that was really not fun or cool which it's not cool but it was kind of just this really intense feeling of like kind of like how you know in the film everyone's from a different district we were all from different neighborhoods we were all from all over los angeles county put into this tiny little home and we're all supposed to just like each other and get along and we're all different ages and you know and then you all have your own different struggles and experiences and i think it was just this very intense feeling of when you're in the group home or when you're out 
you realize no one nowhere really knows what that looks like. It's kind of like, I tell people, it's kind of like being in a medical experiment because you know, you're the only one who's gonna really know how it went down. And so the reason of the point I'm trying to bring up is that my biggest thing for like opening the awareness on pipe to prison line is basically, it sounds silly, but I really do think it can change a lot is destigmatization because the thing is like my entire life, and I, I promise there's a point to this, my entire life of being a foster care kid, being in foster system, I'm white. I was one of the only white kids in my group home. I went through foster care as a white person, seeing things through this really weird dual lens of like, when I went back to, so I went to school in a very white neighborhood. I went to a very nice neighborhood. And then I had to go two hours away to my group home, which was in central Hollywood. And again, I was one of the only white kids in my group home. And I have a point to this. And I remember going back and forth and I was just so unconnected to the kids at my school and then I couldn't really connect to any of the kids in the group home. And it was just this, because I was obviously from a higher end experience. I had my own privileges. I had my privileges through the system. And, you know, I've always tried to tell people in a non-preachy way that like, there, there, is, there is an issue here. There, there is this idea that foster kids don't look like me. And if they do, do you want to know the question I always get? Oh, were you adopted as a little baby in a crib? And, you know, you don't know your family and you're, it's the Disney movie version. People... When I've told people I'm a foster kid or AKA I say adopted or I have legal guardians or whatever is like a nicer word because most people don't know what it is. The, every time the question I get is, you know, oh, I don't know my parents and I was adopted as a baby because I can't be in the streets. I can't have known the foster system. That's not something they associate with me. And when my friend who um, obviously wasn't, you know, we were at the same race mentioned that as well. Oh, all of a sudden, oh, okay, so what street were you from? What, what neighborhood were you from? Oh, your parents were jail or in jail? You know, like the entire switch up of the questions, the expectation that, you know, their parents were in prison and mine weren't. And, you know, oh, my parents aren't criminals, but this person is, you know what I mean? Like there's, there's not to be dark, but you know, that's, that's what I saw. It was a lot of constant, like, <laughs> I, I haven't blunt about that stuff. Like it was a lot of, you know, you know, and as a white foster kid, I do think I had more privileges. I think that there's this assumption that it was weird. It's like, once you become a foster youth, I do say that, you know, for example, interactions with police, I had many. <laughs> um, I think that it was weird before I had interactions with police before I was in the foster care system. And obviously, you know, when they look you up, you, they can see that you're a foster kid. They can see if you had, you know, cases or whatnot, open court cases. And before the cops were always kind of, you know, scary, but they never did anything. They were never intimidating. They listened to me. And then after I had interactions with the police, I noticed they would like look me up. They'd find out I was a foster care. They'd ask me about it. Completely different switch up. Like suddenly I'm guilty. Suddenly the questions are meaner. Suddenly I'm getting like, you know, I'm getting weapons are gestured at me. Suddenly like the treatment's a lot different because you're seen as, oh, well, if you're in foster care, you're a criminal or your parents were. And that's, that's the stigma that it's the double identity association. You do not have an identity. You are the past, you are the parent's identity. That is the only image you will get is whoever, whatever is tied to your court case information that is easily able to look up. If you're a government official, if you're a police officer, you know, all they have to do is type in your name and then they get a case court number or a foster youth identification number. And the, the ranting, I'll be done soon, but the point is, <laughs> it's just like, I get so furious about this stuff because I've, I've lived it through, you know, either side of seeing people who I really love and care about be treated by the system differently than me. And, you know, from police, from social workers, from the foster care system, me getting placement first before them and, and just interesting things in the way people talk to you and people, the, the expectation that, you know, I would never be in a scary situation, but they would be. And that that is something that has to change and has to be spoken out about because the moment, for example, to wrap it up, the moment people think that foster kids can look like someone like me, can look like, you know, Bob Smith, can have a blonde ass cut, you know, can looking dude, can be in foster care, the moment it's not expected for other people who aren't white, who wear certain clothes, who maybe live in a certain neighborhood, they could be normal people. <laughs> they don't necessarily have to be involved in crime. They could just be living their life. And that's the thing is that no one, no one gets that. And, and the more and more people, you know, try to say, oh, well, we have to do this program. I have to do this program. We also have to do it socially. We have to think about it bigger and bigger. We need 
more media platforms. We need more people. We need articles out there. We need, I don't care, albums or something. We need something that changes it bigger and better. Like, like, you know, you have to, we're getting there. We're getting some great stories with, you know, black led characters and black led films and POC diversity. That's not too bad. Sometimes it's a little forced, but you know, most of the time it's pretty good. And, you know, at this point we need more that is foster focused that has that image out there that sends that we are creative. We are not just the stereotype and that we are not just simply dying. <laughs> we are living, we are here. And there needs to be more of that because I've always felt that people don't really know how to see me. And I then don't really know how to see myself because it's a very weird position to navigate in the foster care system. But yes, I think de destigmatization and openness would really open a lot of doors. <laughs> Yes, I thank you so much, Loie. I feel like that you had just really, really, really hit the ball, like on like, you know, especially like when you were talking about like, you know, the privilege that you have, you know, and what the, those experiences have been like, you know, living in your whiteness and like what that was compared to other black or brown foster youth. And I think that that's a beautiful transition into my next question um, in terms of like, you know, with our other panelists, some of the um, disproportionalities that you guys have experienced, the challenges that you guys have saw um, that impact or keep black and brown youth um, from being able to be successful in school, you know, um, and, you know, what what could be done? What, what are some challenges that, what are some of those challenges and what are some solutions? Oh, I was trying to unmute myself. Jasmine, yes, please. That's all. I'm so uh, sorry. And Naisha, please. Yeah, please feel free. Um, uh, can you, so, sorry, what, the, can you repeat the last part of the question? Yes, I don't know why. Loaded, that's a big, yeah, that's a big that's question. But in, um, okay, so, yes, yeah, so. You know, with the disproportionality of black and brown foster youth, you know, what are some of the challenges that you have saw um, that have kept, you know, that keep black and brown foster youth from being able to, um, you know, be successful while in school and go to college and complete college? Um, and um, it's really a piggyback from what um, Loi was saying about, you know, her privilege and what her some of the experiences that she saw from even the differences and, you know, um, with police encountering and like, you know, when they stopped her and, you know, and then like, you know, how she, when, when she got into foster care and how, you know, it didn't matter if she was white, you know, or, you know, it didn't matter, you know, she still was a foster youth and therefore she was, um, you know, a behavioral, you know, I, I don't even know how to say this, but she was someone that, you know, needed to be incarcerated or needed to be reformed or reframed. So um, I want you kind of to piggyback off that and describe yeah. like, you know, things that you have saw and through the lenses of, you know, black and um black and brown foster youth and their experiences yeah so i i think like with in los angeles it is you know disproportionately black and brown um it's hard to to the further you kind of like peel back the more like institutional things that you see that are like wrong not just with the system but with with the country right like my um my family, they're immigrants from El Salvador. And so when my mom came here from, it was right before the war, my great grandmother came right before the war. So they were able to get amnesty. And so like in my like family history, there was a lot of poverty. There was a lot of poverty in the beginning of us like coming to the US and that poverty translated into all kinds of things of living in a poor neighborhood in a neighborhood with very little resources. And so the way that I grew up was I just thought it was a completely normal way of growing up. I mean, we didn't really leave our neighborhood. Everyone was um, black and brown. Again, like we, I only remember really watching like mostly Spanish television when I was growing up. Um, you know, my, my, I was actually raised a portion of my life by my great grandmother because my mom was so young that you know she just kind of gave me away to my great grandma and then I kind of was shuffled around before I ended up in foster care but um I think that my experience like having just being when you grow up in poverty your view of the world is so small um part of like eventually when I did go to college I started to realize how 
I just like, I did not have a really great sense of my identity and my like position in the world as just like a human on top of the trauma and abuse and the things that I, that I saw just because I felt like I was like in this very small bubble. Um, but most, but I think there's like an automatic like criminalization when you are black and black or brown. Um, and it's very unfortunate because as a Latinx woman, I like one, my foster youth identity is not something that anyone can see, but it's my identity that I identify most closely to. Like my experience in the world has been molded most by having grown up this way and being a former foster youth. And, you know, like what Loie was saying, I remember once forgetting my, my social worker didn't bring me my, my bus pass. Um, I got on the train, she had given me a bag full of tokens, and I just forgot to um, tap my card. I forgot to tap my card, get down to the train, a police officer asked me for my tap card. I realized I didn't have my tap card, but I showed him that I had these bags of tokens. He asked me if I stole the tokens, and I said, no, I got them from my social worker. I I said, can I please just go back upstairs to get my, my pass? I, it was an honest mistake. Nope. Wrote me a $300 ticket that I had to go to court for, even though I was, you know, and I remember after that, just feeling like, I don't understand. Like I was speaking kindly to this officer. I was like trying to explain to him. And I felt like he just did not see me as a person. And there's been so many situations like at the group home that I lived in, we did not have keys to the group home. So like every single time we would go to this house, we'd knock on the door and they would check us. They would check our pockets. They would check our jackets. Our, we'd have to take off our shoes. They go through our, you know, like you're just trying to exist. And there's this assumption that you're doing something wrong. And I think when you're black and brown, even if you're not living in, in foster care, there is assumptions about you being criminal. You know, I, I oftentimes feel like I have to wear blazers or I have to like, you know, dress up a certain way or speak a certain way. Like I still have to navigate the world as a, an adult woman um, kind of with certain armor. But when I was younger, when I was 17 years old, 16 years old, like you don't know how to defend yourself. Um, and people who are much older than you, are seeing you and like they're crim I feel like there is just this deep criminalization. I remember also telling someone from my high school who I felt very nervous to tell them that I was living in a group home. It was not something that I would share with people. And I told her that my mom had kicked me out and that's why I lived in foster care. And she her her question to me was, well, what did you do? And I remember just feeling like I never wanted to tell anyone again um, that I lived in a group home because the fact that she immediately thought that I did something and then followed up with people sometimes in my group home would say, well, you know, you only have one mom, you know, blood is thicker than water, you know, um, people make mistakes like, you know, they would say these things that, again, would not just criminalize you but then there were all these other layers and I it's really hard to know if the way that people were interacting with me had to also do with my race if they had certain expectations or assumptions around me already um there's also a lot in like Latinx cultures like that there's supposed to be this deep commitment to family and so like by my own biological family who I'm like a hundred percent estranged from aside from my sisters it's just not a narrative that I I could could put up with because in their eyes I'm a bad daughter and so then going into other spaces where people were just treating me like I was bad it it's tiring it's super tiring and I mean I've had to go through a lot of therapy and it's not without like a lot of trauma but again if you treat someone in enough times like a criminal, I just don't understand how anyone could then wonder why they're turning to doing things that are illegal or having to fend for themselves. Um, and the group homes that I lived in, I mean, we were all different races. We were all different races and cultures, um, but 
most of them were black and brown. And so that is something that always sticks out to me too, is I remember all these places people wondering by the time I got to college, why was everyone in the group home looked like me? And why is it now that I'm in college, very little people look like me. You, you start to understand, and there's deep histories, especially in like Los Angeles County around, around these issues. But if we're talking about just like social workers, attorneys and judges and all, it's like, how, how do we ensure that people are not just automatically bringing their biases and stigmas to someone? You have to really know how to check yourself and bring more empathy to your work instead of coming in with that, an assumption that you don't even realize you might be carrying out. Yes, yes, Jasmine. Yes, Jasmine. I think that that was such a beautiful, a beautiful um, way to end that um, question segment. And I so appreciate both of you guys um, for, you know, introducing or including your, um, you know, your perspective on that. Um, and so I want to, um, you know, kind of lighten up the mood a little bit because I feel like we kind of got like real deep. Um, and so, um, but all three of you guys, I um, mean, Naisha has wrote about her experiences and some of the college hurdles that she has had to overcome in New York. I mean, you three, um, Alex, um, Jasmine, and Loie, uh, recently working on, uh, recently we're working on um, articles that are going to be talking about these same experiences. And so, um, you know, describe your experiences if you can. And I'll start with Alex first. Um, with having or not having school supplies, not having the essential items that you need um, to be able to be able to flourish and be able to stay in school, um, you know, feminine hygiene products. Um, do you feel like that you had the necessary resources that you needed um, to survive at least your freshman year in college? Yeah, so um, my freshman year of college was a total struggle with the navigation of you know, being a former foster youth while also being first in your family to ever attend college or even graduate high school was just um, a challenge in itself. And so having those extra supports that a lot of other youth have is really important. And it wasn't something that I saw just inherently given to me. A lot of those programs that you see for foster youth like to get a backpack and when you're 18 or when you're out of the system. Um, and it, it's only been recently that more, non more nonprofits and like organizations like this one have been focusing on like creating efforts for foster youth to specifically get those materials. But for me, I just remember going to college and just not knowing that I couldn't afford anything and that things were going to be difficult until I got my Chafee grant, until I got the financial aid. Um, so it was always a struggle just waiting for those things. And there were specific policies around receiving that funding that made it even more difficult. Uh, for example, with the Chafee funds, they wanted to wait until you were a month into school to um, pretty much solidify the fact that you were attending college at that time. And that makes it really difficult for foster youth. I remember having to wait weeks to buy my books or just asking other people how I could get the free PDF version. So um, yeah, I think there needs to be more of an emphasis on setting kids up for success and um, realizing the fact that, I mean, we were being taken care of by the state. So it is the responsibility of them to do better. and show up for us and guarantee that we're going to have a successful or even like equitable playing field in the college experience that for me was not there but thankfully through applying for scholarships through getting in touch with other programs like the guardian scholars i was able to find other things to supplement that and i wasn't always able to buy my own supplies okay. Yes, thank you so much, Alex. Thank you. Um, Loi, Niasia, I'll pass that question over to you guys if you guys are available. And then Jasmine, you can um, set us out with the you know, wonderful end. Um, but one of the reasons why before um, Loi chimes on that I wanted to ask this question um, is because I think that no one ever talks about like the resources. Like uh, I, we, we started this back to school drive, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. Um, but you know, I get a lot of questions about like, why did we wanna do this? And I'm like, well, I'm being a Raquel to other foster youth that I needed when I was coming out of the system. And nobody talks about, 
you know, the emancipation trauma that you, you experience, you know, the home being emancipated from the system, you know, and coming out of the system with this trash bag with nothing. When I went to college, I had a trash bag of like some clothes, one little purse that I held on to for dear life because I bought it myself on my first paycheck from Knott's Berry Farm and a radio that I still have. It doesn't work, but it's so sentimental to me um, because my mentor brought it. And so I think that it's important that organizations see, um, you know, the, the, the importance of, you know, eliminating some challenges for foster youth before they even get to school. It's like how you guys want me to focus, um, you know, in class when I don't even know how I'm going to have like tampons or maxi pads when my period comes on or, you know, something of those things. These are like real life experiences that people are having. Like, you know, how do you want me to focus on school um, when I don't even know where, where my next meal is coming from or where I'm going to eat? And if I go get food stamps and they want me to work, but I can't work because I'm in school. And it's just like this cycle that keeps creating, um, you know, more trauma and more generational um, you know, stigmas that keep adding onto our life. And so I just really think that it's a really, really good question. Um, and that it's important that organizations see and identify um, some of the resources that um, could be made available through donations um, for foster youth and helping them out. And so, Loie, um, you know, what were some of your experiences with receiving supplies and essential items? Do you feel like that you had all the necessary resources and tools that you needed to survive while you were going to school? Yeah, I think... Mine was a little bit of a rare experience because someone who I'm still connected to today, probably the only good thing that came out of college was my mentor from the Foster Youth Club organization, Guardian Scholars, at the school I went to. Um, didn't connect with a single other person but her, but she was basically like their head mentor, manager of the meetings, all of that, the receptionist, she still is. And she always, she was good. She looked out for us. She, she's a good woman. She still talks to me to, to this day. We've known each other for like four or five years. I, I, I love her very, very much. And um, she gets you know, dinner with me for my birthday and stuff. She really gives, you know, care and cares about us. Um, I would say I, I was lucky because she can always pull enough strings. And, you know, the whole rule, as people have mentioned before, is like, you can only take one, or if you're getting a snack, you can only take this much, or if you need pads or tampons, you only take a certain amount. But the thing is, because a lot of people didn't know about the resource center, we actually had a lot of extras. <laughs> so that's really, I'd say the only reason why I never had to worry about that stuff until I, I left college or until I was living on my own because of the pandemic, I wasn't able to get those resources anymore. And it really sucked because I realized how much I relied on it. And because I was always seeing her once a week, I, I didn't even think about it. Like she would have snacks waiting for me. She would have like these little to-go bags. I always had school supplies. I always had extra school supplies that I gave to the other kids in the dorm because some people didn't have some. And I kind of became like this little resource center myself because we always had extras because just a lot of people didn't know. But to, to make your point more like, you know, my experience is a bit more rare. I would say that one thing a lot of people, I think a lot of organizations kind of, it gets always, we're always talking about this. We're always talking about foster kids in college or the goal is to get to college. And one thing I've always kind of noticed is like, be a student, right? To be a student in college and any higher education it's a full-time job and you are working. You're wor it doesn't matter if you're part-time, you're working. You're working full-time all the time when it comes to school because you are doing so many other things, especially if you're planning to get another degree after that or if you have to go to an internship, do apprentice hours, do whatever it is, which most of the time you have to. If you are writing six essays and then you're also taking care of kids or your siblings or whatever it is, or if in my case, it was myself, but I was still doing a full-time job without actually getting to work because I had to support my full ride scholarship. I had to be in full-time school, but I didn't actually have scheduled time because um, I'll give a little note. I went to uh, an arts program and I was in film school. And if you don't know, film school classes are about four to five hours long. So my classes, I'd have one class that would be almost five hours long. So I could not actually go to work because I was literally in school for almost all of my freshman year. Like every single day I could not work. I was so busy with school and with that that being a full-time job being a foster kid no matter the situation is also uh, you're being your own parent so it's kind of like you're expected to be a parent you're expected to be a grown adult an individual right and you're expected to work with school because that's the job and the thing I've realized is that it's I mean not to be kind of blunt but no wonder you know, we can't succeed enough or, or we can't have a congruent linear pattern to finishing college because we're expected to be the ones that get our driver's license, get our doctor's appointments, get our dentist appointments, get our essential needs, 
uh, provide a roof over our own heads, uh, make sure that our cow fresh is constantly updated because they're constantly canceling on us. And they always have some goddamn little rule. And now you lost a cow fresh benefits and now you can't get food and they're always canceling it. And there's all these issues I remember running into in school. I lost my cow fresh like four times in college. Like it was crazy. I'm losing it again. I have to recertify again. It's just, it's this constant thing of like, you know, <laughs> school isn't just, I need supplies and once I get them, I'll be okay. It's like, but how frequent is it? And how reliable is it? And is it the right kind of supplies you need? What I would say is that it has to be a, a bigger conversation, but donation is always accepted. And I think it should just be like this. You know what? I also have, um, I have my time I can give. So maybe I can like pitch to my company. We have extra pencils that we can donate out. I have you know, we have extra backpacks because we partnered with this, you know, the more and more companies and organizations know about it, I feel like the more creative they can get because there's a lot of companies, even like random companies you wouldn't think of that get extra supplies and resources from other brands that they partner with. And they always have extra supplies and stuff. I've, I've seen it. I used to work in an office. So it's like, you know, there's, there's stuff like that. The more resources, I think what it is, is a lot of people don't understand how they could provide help and how those resources connect to this situation and these programs and these kids and us and you know I think that it's it's something to really just it more and more needs to be said that you know this is like a full-time job and then you're expected to be your own parent and I'm currently dealing with that and you know you can't you can't you can't survive like that that's why you were given you know whether or not it worked out that's why life starts with more than just you it has to be you know a whole support system and then the foster care life is that system getting you know, kind of pushed out with different roots and other things growing. And, you know, hopefully I think with being a foster kid, you know, you can find your way back. You can find the right people that you're supposed to be rooted with and grow with and with a little garden. And, you know, I think, I think there is hope. I just think that there has to be more focus and understanding that it is not, like I said before, a lack of drive or that, you know, oh, well, we just can't find the right supplies. There's always a way to find the right supplies with the right resources if we can connect it to the right reason. I think that there's always a way to where we need to find that answer. So, <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you so much, Loie. I agree. I agree so much. Um, and did um, Alex or Niasia, did you guys want to chime in on the question um, before I pass it on to Jasmine? I'm I'm pretty much good. I I, I believe I summed it up earlier. Um, but just to give a quick uh, recap for anybody who did not hear me the first time like um I was kind of treated like like the foster children in the home I wasn't the only one I was kind of treated like a germ like in a sense like they would there would be no tissue inside of the bathroom like because they didn't want to touch the same tissue that you know we were touching there would be no toothpaste inside of the bathroom and I just wanted to pay homage to um foster care to success um etv um training voucher they helped me so much i was able to buy my own deodorant my own tissue after that my own toothpaste toothbrush razors you know pads the list goes on and on of the things that we don't have and if we complain about it it's a 10-day notice to another home that's more than likely i mean the no tissue thing that was my only home that did that um but that was more than likely to have other issues. So it was like, I was, I wanted, I started college in that home. And so I just wanted to stay there. And I'm glad that I did. I stayed as long as I could, but then I made sure that I had a 10 day notice um, for myself. And then I was able to leave and to start college and eventually got my, my first apartment. Um, there's some construction outside, so hopefully you all can hear me, but um, when I went to college 13 years ago, yeah, they, there were not as many programs that were, like I see now, that give out like dorm kits or um, things like to help you furnish your dorm. Um, the group home that I was leaving actually told me like, after you move into college, like you're not able to come back here, like you can't contact us, you can't see your therapist anymore. So it was like, I, the only place that I knew that even though I wasn't really happy there was also like disconnecting from me because I was going somewhere else. 
Um, so it was a very mixed emotion time. And then move-in day is also like a very emotional family-centric time. So it a move-in day for me felt like exciting, but also embarrassing. Like I did have mentors that helped me move in, um, none of them who looked like me. And so I felt just like, you know, I just felt different um, and again, sort of embarrassed of my situation through no fault of my own, but um, having helped both my sisters move into college, like recently, um, they did have, like, they were able to, I felt like there were all these programs that were able to help them get things that they both needed um, on top of the support that we gave them. I think they also got like support from IOP. Um, and I feel like programs like that are so important because anything that you that you get as a foster youth like it just feels like some someone is saying like keep going like I believe in you like keep just like it's help that you're getting from someone and you don't know this person like they're a stranger and they're like all of a sudden now something that you really need you have if you need like a blanket or you need this and like as someone who didn't receive those things and then seeing my sisters receive those things. Like I remember them coming home with their big bags full of stuff like, oh my God, look at this blanket I got. And they had like brand new socks or they they gave me a whole bag of shampoo like that it's gonna last me all semester. Like those concrete things that seem like, so maybe like not a big deal. It's telling someone like, I believe in you and I someone put this together for you. And it actually has like, I feel like it has a lot of energy of like love. And on top of that, if they do receive other support from financial aid, like it can go towards other emergencies or other things that will end up coming up because we don't have family support. And an 18 year old or I, you know, again, being older, like I know many of my peers who still receive support from their family, even in their thirties. And so like, everyone needs support from community. Um, all of these things like make such a difference and even support that I still receive now from, from my community that I've known for a long time, like it still is so meaningful to me. Um, and so, yeah, I'm like so glad that, that you're doing, that we're doing programs like this because like every little thing helps. And I remember having to buy like my own laptop and you know, it was really expensive. And I talked about in like the article I wrote that I even, I had to buy my own backpack at college. And I remember like never seeing, having seen a backpack even cost that much money. Like I, maybe I would have seen something like at Walmart or at a swap meet be like $20, but that backpack was $70. Like I didn't know that a laptop backpack, you know, would be so expensive, but I kept that backpack all four years because I just could not believe that a backpack could be so expensive. And if you're carrying a heavy laptop and books back then, I also didn't realize you probably also need something that's more supportive. So that $20 backpack may not work for you um, without you like maybe hurting yourself or, you know, you might have like a back problem from. So yeah, all of those things are, are, are such a help. And I'm so happy that these programs exist now because back then, and it was like pre-social media, like unless someone told you or called you about it and you're there was just no way of knowing that something like like something like this and e-gift cards like I feel like back then they weren't really sending us e-gift cards either so there's so much opportunity now for like younger foster youth to get help much more simply yes thank you so much Jasmine and I love that you always just really like tie your connection I mean connect your response back to like your experience and some of the things the details that you have went through so we have like two more questions but um for the last segment of the um webinars I always want to make sure that we're providing some type of advice um offering some suggestions and so um you know how could your experience have been um and what is how could your experience have been um, a more valuable um, having the support of your resource parents or having the support of a mentorship or having the support of a social worker and what could they have done differently um, or what could social workers or resource parents or um, program leaders mentors do differently um, in this day um, to help um, raise the graduation rate um, for foster youth I mean so Alex I'll pass it to you since we haven't heard from you in a minute yeah so for me um my social worker, well, 
I first, I got arrested when I was in high school and I dealt with some like legal issues. Of course, like the apple doesn't fall from the tree a lot of the time. So that's just a result of like the trauma that you've been going through in your life. Um, but instead of seeing that with grace, my social worker suggested I change schools to keep me out of trouble. And for me, that was kind of like a slap in the face because I, you know, wasn't gifted in talented classes. I was a high achieving student. Even when I did have my dips and stuff, um, my teachers knew that I was capable and um, my family knew that I was capable too. So for me, it was really difficult to see her um, basically try to punish me by ripping away the sense of community that I had built with my peers throughout my life. And I explained to her how important it was for me to stay in that school because one, the community, and two, the Long Beach College Promise would allow me to go to college despite my low GPA. And that's a program that I honestly owe my life to because I don't think if I would have gone to a community college first or if I um, you know, would have gotten lost on that pathway, I don't think I would have you know, been where I am today. So I was really grateful to fight back and ultimately win. Um, but I don't think that social workers should be should be punishing youth. And I don't think that they, um, they really realize that there needs to be more grace and we need to be more empathetic to the situations that foster youth are going through. And um, all in all, just we need to be better about informing youth about their educational rights and resources. A lot of people don't know that you have the ability to attend your school of origin and you have a right to do that. Um, and your foster care placement needs to find transportation for you. And um, yeah, I just, for me, knowing that now and not knowing that before, I know that it was something that I could have um, better advocated for myself for them. But um, yeah, I'm just hoping that the foster youth on this call today can take that away. Yes, I love that. Thank you so much, Alex. And I'm glad that you threw in that last final disclaimer of um, offering some advice to foster youth um, because that was going to be my next question. So I guess we can tie these two questions in together. And so, um, Loie, I'll pass it to you um, next. And so um, the question is basically, what is some advice or some suggestions that you can offer resource parents, social workers, um, foster youth right now um, that, you know, that can help them, um, that can help them or provide some, you know, additional knowledge that can help foster you, you know, actually graduate, um, and not drop out of school. <clears throat> well, like I said earlier, um, we, I think the funny thing with foster kids is like not, not a single one of them is like, oh, I, I, I don't need money or <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll be able to make this fine without any financial help. Like, I think, I think you're aware once you start that that's going to be an issue that you're going to need to find a way to supply that or get it supplied to you. And that I think is a huge barrier sometimes with school. It's a, listen, I'm not, I'm not a very positive person about this. I'm not even in school right now. So honestly, I, I always try to do these talks and think of like, okay, don't, don't be the negative one. Try to, <laughs> try to be the one that's positive about it. But um, what I could say, I guess, as someone who had all the experience of what not to have done, AKA like, if you're a guardian, if you're you know resource parent, if you're if you're a foster youth wondering about college, I'd say I had all the stuff that maybe shouldn't have happened done, and I also use it as advice to myself. And and basically, what I will say is that you know with resource parents, like foster kids are always so much more than just their college education. There's an entire person behind that. So like one thing I have to lead with because I'm I'm kind of a, a dual person. I think that. Like one, one side of me is like, screw college. But then the other side is like, yay, Alex. Yay, everyone else. You did it. <laughs> like, it's kind of like, I, I'm very dual because I think that I got screwed, but I know other kids get wonders and that they are so much more better for it. So I, I think I'm just a dual person. I think that what I'll say is that you're going to be the best resource for yourself, regardless what you do, that as long as it's on a path that is keeping you safe healthy sound of mind and away from harm as much as humanly possible that you can do and put in charge of yourself you know it is about your wellness your safety 
think of it, I always tell the people to think of it as kind of like, you know, if you're walking on the sidewalk, depending on who you are, and you see a, you know, a bug with a damaged wing or something, right? You see a bee that's kind of limping. Maybe your first reaction is to, I don't know, step on it. I don't know. I don't know that kind of person. That's not me. But, you know, you look at it and you go, okay, I'm going to walk around that. I'm going to let it, you know, do its thing. I, you you kind of have to see yourself as like that, you know, whatever's going on, you have to just walk around it. If it's in the way, if it's a struggle, you can't look at it as uh, an immediate solution or a fix. You have to see things as like, you're going to find out, you're going to find out if your wing gets fixed, you're going to find out if you're going to get to make it, you just have to kind of keep supplying yourself with that resource of emotional support, which is very difficult to do. But also, you know, I think a lot of it is that we get told, or at least I was told personally, and a lot of the time that I basically had no worth or value unless I went to college. And I did go to college. And I still ended up almost homeless. <laughs> and I still ended up dropped at, you know, pausing college. And, you know, the, the point is that I think a lot of people around you, including maybe even yourself, are going to tell you that maybe you're only worth a value if you're a college, if you're a foster youth entering college, right, might be that you're going to college. And, and that's just not true. You know, I think that you can learn a trade, you can learn a value, you can learn a lot of different creative abilities. Um, I really wish that would be part of my advice. I really wish I picked up a trade sooner than later, because I think I could have gotten a higher position for the trade I work in now, which is like, artisanal cafes and uh, genuinely I think if I picked it up sooner I could be like an assistant manager right now so I really do think that you know there should be a focus on like okay are we doing college great are we not here's a bunch of trades you can do that aren't just construction work or community service because that's usually what they pin to foster youth to do I think that there should be more inclusion of like hey maybe learn how to be a barista and not just Starbucks like maybe learn to do fancy tricks in cafes and then you get hired at fancy LA restaurants like there should be more trade focused itineraries, maybe like programs that teach us how to type faster so we could be like um, assistants on a salary job because then, you know, we know how to type really fast. There's, there should be different types of programs that can support and supply trade skills to foster youth that I think can appreciate. That's, I guess, part of my advice is learning trades maybe keeping an open mind on, on your college education while still pursuing it. You can still have that trade maybe take a couple courses or maybe take a whole year to focus on a trade. And then once you get into school, you can still have a job to back you up on any of those bills or frustrations. And that's my biggest thing is that I was really, really let down with that. I did not get any, I was basically just shoved out into college and I was, I was, you know, basically homeless at that point, just told to figure it out. And I have struggled ever since and I still currently struggle. So I think that, you know, trying to be positive. Um, my last note is just, you know, as kids or whoever you are trying to enter foster youth, I mean, into college education, think of it as this way as like, whatever ends up happening, even if you're one credit away from graduating and let's say something happens, the whole point is that you sat down, you wrote out a word, you wrote out an essay, you got there, you've done it, you've done so much more than when you were 12 or 13 or six or eight or nine or 16 or 12 or whatever age it's been, you ever thought was gonna happen. You know, whatever you've done today, me even being part of this, like, I never thought that was going to happen when I was being, you know, shoved court teddy bears in my hands. Like, you know, you never think that you're going to get to the point that you are now. So you have to tell yourself when you're not feeling so great, you never thought you were going to get there. And yet you are. <laughs> you never thought you were going to be finished, you, that, that you were going to be flying with a broken wing. And yet you are. So I think that's the thing is you just have to kind of encourage yourself as hard as it is, because no one else is going to have the right words but you. You're only going to have the right words for yourself. And you're not going to know that until you just shut up and actually talk to yourself and go, you know what? We have this. We've had it before and we have it again. And that's what we just have to kind of keep telling ourselves. <laughs> yes, I love that you shout out to I got this I was like literally mocking the words that you were saying because I knew that I felt like that's what you was going to say and I appreciate your passion. Um, for answering this question and offering the, all of that suggestions. Um, and I love that you gave um, the need to shout out, um, you know, the importance of going to trades, um, learning trades and being an entrepreneur while pursuing school. Because um, it's just college is not the only avenue or the only way, um, you know, and it's not, you know, the most lucrative way, shoot. It actually puts you in debt, if you ask me. Um, but unless you learn how to do it the right way, but you know, sometimes it definitely can be, you know, beneficial. I definitely don't think that I would be here as the program manager of the YVR program if I didn't 
and um, how I went to school. I definitely didn't need to go to school to get two master degrees. I definitely felt like I could have worked here with one. I don't know who told me to go to school and get two, but I'm glad for those experiences um, because when I talk to other foster youth and I'm like, yeah, I got two master degrees, they're like, oh my God, congratulations, you know? And it's just like this inspiration and this like, you know, words of encouragement and stuff. So just thank you so much, Loe, um, for your insight. And then, you know, also helping us see the other side of this, it, uh, helping us see the other side of the spectrum as well. Um, and so we're getting ready to close up, but, and we have a couple of um, final things that we want to share with you guys. But before I want to give Jasmine and I, Asia, um, if they would like to um, come forward, the opportunity to answer that final question as well um, in regards to, um, you know, providing some advice to other foster youth, resource parents, social workers. Um, did you guys have any final thoughts that you would like to add? Yeah, I would just share that with like the amount of people that I had in my life, like I mentioned, social workers, attorneys, like there were a lot of people, but there weren't necessarily people who were actually listening. Um, and once I became like a kinship caregiver to both my sisters who were both very, very different. They're one year apart. I had them like their entire teenage years from uh, like eighth grade through when they went to college um, is that we all struggled with feelings of like worthiness and our self-esteem was not strong because we did not grow up in, in an environment that made us feel like we were important. And so something that I had to learn and like heal through my own journey of raising them was realize that I needed to really validate their feelings and their experiences. And so while the foster care system has so many things that it has to fix, if you're someone that works with a young person, like listen to them, like, don't just go and do your meeting with them. Like, I felt like I would just have people meet with me just so that they can like check off that they had their meeting with me, but no one was really like actually talking to me or listening to me. So if you have a young person, like ask them about their day, ask them about what they're doing, you know, to spend their time, kind of just validate their feelings um, and ask them like, how can I help? How can I be most helpful to you? Even if it's just like, how can I help today? Like, how can I help make today a little bit better? Um, and const just ask your youth as much as you can, like, oh, how can I help? And how are you doing today? Um, because every day is a struggle. And again, our foster youth experience will be with us our entire life. And so even even now I, I still have things come up for me and it's always helpful to have someone to be able to vent to and that I can seek support. Um, but yeah, validate their feelings and don't come in with um, judgment against them because if we all work with foster youth in one way or another, and if we're all helping to validate their feelings and experiences and remind them that they are not these experiences that they're going through, that they're separate, I think like we can at least help increase like um, mental health and like self acceptance. And I think that can sometimes also go a long way because we didn't grow up being taught how to like care for ourselves. Yes, Jasmine. Well, I just wanna thank all of you guys, Alexis, um, Jasmine, Niasia, um, Loie. I, I wanna thank all of you guys for everything and this beautiful conversation, I felt like that we were able to take away a couple of, a lot of key um, things that, you know, obstacles and challenges that foster you have to face. Um, you guys, um, you know, us living in different times, growing experiences this system in different parts of our lives at different ages. Um, we have similar, you know, acknowledgements of concerns for things that have, have happened to not only us, but people and our peers that we have saw um, and so I just want to just thank you guys for being vulnerable today. Um, it takes a lot to come on camera, to introduce yourself to the world and to a different audience and share your experiences. But I just want you to know that you definitely are making a difference. You're definitely making an impact um, and that your words are so valuable and so needed. And that's why I created a space like this because I, we didn't have spaces like this. And it's important for us to talk about and share ideas and share suggestions. There were a lot of social workers in the um, building today a lot of resource parents on the call today, they can take away some of these, you know, valuable, um, you know, things, key takeaways that, you know, they can use now, <laughs> excuse me, to better help their, 
you know, youth um, that they're caring for get through um, the system. And so just thank you all again so, 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 so much for being here. Um, and shout out to our audience and our panelists. And so at this time, you guys should see a post evaluation dropping into your chat. Um, we will just ask you guys, you don't have to do it right now, but we just ask you if you do get the recording and the um, follow-up email to just take some time, please give your honest opinions and thoughts. Um, you guys, I really look at every survey after every event. I utilize the information to try to make these events better, to try to bring you an impactful conversation. I'm actually working on our webinar list for 2024 a year. Um, and I take away um, some of the conversations that our social workers, our CASA workers said that they want to have. And so um, please utilize this forum because it helps guide me into essentially just creating conversation and figuring out best ways to introduce topics um, to folks and everything. And so it's if you um, are here because you would like to see for, um, the certificate of credit, um, please email me and I will um, uh, will, will please email me or if you will find the information in, in your follow up email and we'll show you how you can be able to um, get the credit that you need for being here today um, at the meeting. If you stayed here the entire meeting, um, just duly note that part. Um, um, our next webinar, which is an exciting conversation I'm so looking forward to having, I'm in the process of collaborating and creating a project um, um, a, so centered around black and brown males, Hispanic and black foster youth and to be specific. Um, and their experiences connected into mentorship and journalism. I'm working on this project um, that I'm hoping to bring to UCLA. Um, and so we're gonna kick this, um, this project off with a conversation geared to black and brown um, male foster youth. Um, there's not a lot of spaces created for males, especially black and brown males to speak about their experiences in the system um, and the things that they that have reshaped or guided their lives or put them on the path to success or you know, the path to less. Path to less. I um, mean, so we want to hear from some um, former foster youth, current foster youth with these experiences um, that are male that can talk about the cycles um, that they experience while being in the foster care, experience juvenile justice, group home, incarceration, um, and homelessness. And so um, if you are a male that, that has foster care experience in the audience, or you know a male that has foster care experience in the audience that identifies as black and brown that would like to participate or make a good contribution to this conversation, we would love to have them. We will also include the way that you could register for this in the chat, as well as um, how um, folks could sign up to be panelists for this if you would like to share this information. I am currently looking for panelists um, to Siladale confirm two panelists, two more panelists for this one. And then so we have a writing opportunity right now that's happening for DC, Washington, DC, foster youth, and those um, that are native, excuse me, those of native or tribal descent and heritage um, foster youth. I'm talking about their experiences in foster care, especially with the Indian Child Welfare Act just passing, which one of our contributors, Jackie Robles, wrote an incredible story about. But we want to hear, um, provide a space for um, the Washington, D.C. foster youth to amplify their voices. And we also want to create a space for um, Native or tribal heritage um, foster youth um, to amplify their voices as well. And so we are including this information in the chat and you also receive it in your follow-up email. If you know someone that would be interested it, um, they can be compensated $400 for writing 750 to 950 words and working with us to become a publishable author, um, author um, with the article on um, the imprint or in our magazine, Foster Families Today. And then so one of the greatest things about this event um, was that I was able to um, tie it into you know, the, the essential importance of you know, why I started this. So YVR is working with community partners to support Los Angeles County youth um, through their academic journey for the 2024 um, and 25 school year. Um, this event is called Pack to the Future, a backpack drive for high school and college around foster youth. Um, you guys, I am still seeking donations. If you could donate $5 worth of school supplies, $5 worth of paper, $5 worth of pencils, I'm telling you that it would definitely go a long way. If you are an organization that is in LA County that would like to set up 
an informational booth, um, you know, highlighting your program that's dedicated to and serving foster youth, um, providing some resources and such sources um, and tools to foster youth. Please get in contact with me. We have free vendor tables for you as long as your program serves foster youth. Um, but we are hosting a community event in Crenshaw and Jefferson in the Merck Park area, July 29th. And I would love, love, love for everyone that um, can attend to be in attendance. It's going to be really great. Um, we're going to have the food vendors, um, some informational programs. I'm hosting a financial literacy workshop. I'm in the midst of um, this um, event for resource parents, caregivers, and students who just need to learn about budgeting um, and all of those above before they as they prepare to get ready for school. And so if this is something that you would like to support, um, be a volunteer for, um, even send your um, your um, DPS. I know it's a social workers in LA County. If you have high school on this call, if you have high school students um, or college bound students that you used to work with that might be in need of some supplies, please, 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 please have them fill out the request form, um, the wish list form, um, and 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 or for their information to me so that I can reach out to them. This is going to be a really, really great event, and um, it, it really is from the heart. I wanted to put this event on because I know the struggles that I dealt with with you know trying to finish school and not having anything going to school and not and starting school and not having anything and what that is like and I want to eliminate some of the challenges that students can foresee before they even step foot on campus and so if you would like to help support foster youth in need please feel free to do so we will drop that information in the chat for you um, also for you to learn more about what we're doing um, and invite you to our community event. And so the Youth Voice of Horizons um, program um, inspires and serves and empowers more youth than ever before 2023 and beyond. Um, you guys, last year we published over 140 articles from foster youth, um, foster youth directly talking about their experiences um, that Oh, I'm sorry, their experiences that they have experienced while being in the system. Um, and so everything that you see with YVR, we are different on Orthodox program because it is by foster youth, for foster youth, is led by foster someone that has experienced the foster youth juvenile justice um, program. So everything that we do goes to support um, the foster youth um, in our program. And so they are compensated for their articles. They're compensated when they participate in these webinars. They're compensated, um, uh, compensated for their internship opportunities and everything that they do we when they show up we we pay them for it and so um i just want to thank everybody um for being here today and everything that you guys have done to support the you versus program the you versus rising program at fmc if you would like to stay informed of all of the things that we are doing here please follow us on our social medias or with our newsletter um, which is one of the most important ways to stay in in touch and up to date with what we're doing we also have a story newsletter so that you can also be able to receive um, um, um some of our up-to-date articles that as they're coming out and some of the creative op-eds and stories that we're working on. So again, I just wanna thank everybody that is on this call um, for being here today. Shout out to all of our panelists, Night Asia, Alexis, Jasmine, Loey. We really appreciate you guys. Um, and I look forward to having you all four come back um, and being a part of our webinar series. Um, and of course, we always look forward to um, having you guys participate um, and, um, and share your experience um, through articles. So you guys look um, forward to receiving um, reading articles that are going to be published by all four of these people. Um, now, Asia has two articles coming out. Um, one um, in regards to building better homes in the New York system. Um, so youth are not cycled through the system. Um, and she's going to have one coming out about mentorship soon through Foster and Families Today magazine. And then Alex, Loey, and Jasmine are all three working on articles um, right now that are going to be published in regards to today's topic um, and the importance of having school supplies, essential items, and some obstacles that college students um, experience. And so, again, uh, thank you all to my four panelists. I really, really appreciate you all today. Jasmine, um, Loey, Alex, Niaja, you did a wonderful job and keep being a vessel um you know the experience definitely wasn't hard and i don't wish the easy and i don't wish to experience the foster care system on anyone you know but you know through these experiences we get to be vessels um, um for systems of change and so um i hope that this has been a healing experience for you guys as it was for me um and please stay in touch with me and connect with me um and just shout out to our audience members for being here today and we appreciate you guys until next time we'll see you on the 18th of july 
um, and you guys have a great day.